on previous videos, I've talked about the Contemporary Resort Hotel that you see behind me and how it was the centerpiece of everything and how everything kind of revolved around it. But what I didn't talk about was some specifics about the construction, the design, how it was used and why it was the centerpiece. So I thought I'd take a little time on this video and talk about those things and kind of correct that error and let you know a little bit more about the contemporary and sort of its, its place in history and a little bit more about why it is what it is. Um, and as you know, you have the whole convention center that expands beyond me there. When Walt Disney had this concept for his prototype community of tomorrow, this place he, he wanted to have uh, people in coming and working and living and doing things, he had this idea where he was going to get the best and the brightest of his Disney organization and the best and the brightest from industry to come together to make something really interesting. One of the first things the Walt Disney Company did was they said, you know, we need to make a show place, something that really stands out that we could really sell. And it would serve two purposes. One, it's the sales pitch that we could say, hey, look, we worked with industry really well. And two, it could actually work as a convention center where we could bring other people in and show them things about what we're doing. And that became the basis for the Contemporary Resort. So if you go and you look at some of the early maps of Walt Disney World in the resort complex, one of the things you'll notice is the Contemporary Resort was right in the middle of the map. It was basically the central point, the focal point of everything that was going on around the Walt Disney property. The idea was to kind of make that the show place, to make that the, center, the centerpiece, to, uh, so that it could be something that they could really show off. Now, why did they want to show it off? Well, this goes back to working with U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel was this conglomerate that they were working with to help build the property. U.S. Steel had these ideas for uh, future of building and uh, what they could do in the future. And one of the ideas they had was to do some modular construction. At the time, there wasn't much going on. But they had an idea. They could build a steel frame and actually insert things around it in that steel frame to make the hotel. So between Disney and U.S. Steel, a plan was born. So they came up with this idea for an A-frame construction building that would be very long, and you could put hotel rooms along in it, and you could also put a little convention area where you could have some uh, meeting space on one part of it. Now the thing is, because it's an A-frame construction that's very long, you have to have some means of being able to get from the ground floor to the top floor. And so you wind up with a central column and a very large space. It's voluminous. It's a blimp hanger. It's like a canyon. And so they called it the Grand Canyon Concourse and decided to put a mural in the middle. Now you can listen to the rest of the story about that mural and how it all came together on the show I'm linking up above. But just keep in mind that the idea was to create something that really brought together this idea of community and people living together in this Grand Canyon. The mural was done by Disney legend Mary Blair. She decided to create something like a Pueblo village that would showcase people living in the Grand Canyon. So the ground floor would be like the bottom, all the way down to the bottom of the canyon, and the top, up on the ninth floor, would be in the clouds. Now the interesting part of the mural is, she did the mural on all four sides of the uh, column. But because of the way there's a, like a bridge that goes across between each side of it and um, you had to actually break it up and there were actually two murals on either side of that. So there's actually six murals total that are, exist on there. Two are very large and take up the whole panel and two are, are narrower but are on either side of, the, uh, of that bridge. There are animals, there are people, there's all kinds of things along in there that are really interesting. There's some other uh, textured things in there too that are like supposed to be like pottery and things like that too. There's one special item that's up there and that's the five-legged goat. Now, as far as the actual uh, opening of the resort, once they opened it, they were able to use the convention center. Now you have to remember that in Orlando, there really was no convention space available up until the Walt Disney World Resort came. And this was the first large-scale convention space that they had that they could use to bring people in. And use it they did. So Disney always was trying to make a pitch and sell things and make sure that they were getting the best and the brightest, getting companies to come in and work with them. So they'd bring them through here and they'd parade things out. If they wanted to show people something, this is where they'd bring them. And remember that, you know, Richard Nixon used it to go talk to the, the Writers Association when he gave his I'm Not a Crook speech. And then uh, it was used again when... Uh, the Disney company was pitching the idea for Epcot, and you had a number of people that came through there, including Jimmy Carter, and all these people were there hearing about Epcot, and it was a great opportunity for them to be together in one spot. And then, of course, you had the Governor's Conference in 1975 that came there, 
And that governor's conference was really kind of interesting because this was, with, this was a time when they could really pitch the idea of making Walt Disney World something more, right? Actually building on the idea of what Epcot was going to be. This is where it all kind of came together. They'd been open for a couple of years and they were trying to figure out what they were going to be next and how were they going to fulfill on Walt's vision. And this was the time and the place to do it. So kind of interesting that they brought all these people in and they shared with them the ideas that they had. Now, as I said, this was the only convention center in town for the longest time. So these, were, these rooms in, this, in, in the contemporary were always in use. In fact, they had to build the extension on the convention center, which is that uh, maybe it's green and pink colored building. It has like an awning on it that's a little bit green and pink. It's actually an extension that they put on to have more convention space. And there's some larger rooms in there that they can actually use because they realized they needed more space. Now, something you'll notice over time, if you ever look up conventions and things that are going on, a lot of different places like to go to warmer climates when it's wintertime. Florida was where everybody wanted to go. So there was always a convention going on somewhere in Florida. And because Orlando had that great space right there at the Walt Disney World Resort, and Disney pitched it that way, hey, come down here, have your, have your meetings here, bring your families, enjoy the uh, vacation kingdom too. And so that worked out really well for them that they were able to do that. Now, I remember during the 70s and 80s, every time I would go to the Walt Disney World Resort, I would take some time and go over to the Contemporary just because I love the Contemporary. And I would um, go by and see what meetings were going on. Couldn't tell you what they were, couldn't tell you if they mattered to me or anything, but there was always something going on. And that's what was fascinating to me. And then as an adult, doing different things where there's different conferences and things going on, there seemed to be always something going on at the Walt Disney World Resort, mostly at the Contemporary. Now, more recently, it started to move to the, uh, Cor uh, the Coronado Springs where they're creating, creating a larger space for uh, meetings and so forth. And there's some talk about potentially removing the um, convention space and the meeting space from the contemporary, maybe just keeping a couple of the rooms there, but removing that extra building and maybe creating another vacation club property there. I hope they don't, but if they do, it's fine. I mean, that's their business if they do, but I really hope they don't because there's a certain nostalgia for that and the way it was built and the things that go on there. I mean, I'm just amazed at how it grew and how there are so many organizations that come there so regularly now. And it's really pretty neat that they still use it that way and it's still that, that sort of specter to it. And you can go by and go into some of these rooms when you've got a conference going on there and it's kind of interesting to be able to go into it. Disney wanted to promote itself and it promote its brand and sell it. And the way to do that was by creating this convention center space that they could use that way. And the hotel is a great hotel and a great way to show off some other things that they're talking about and some of the really amazing things that are in the hotel space. But it's, you know, the hotel itself, you know, you look at it and you go, yeah, the rooms are okay. They're nothing great. Are they worth the price of admission? <laughs> I don't know. The Contemporary always had this special place just because it was so cool and futuristic looking. And it had the monorail that rode right through it. It comes through an opening and the reason that it can come through the opening and bugs don't come in is because they have this huge stream of air that blows downward. And by blowing the air downward, they're actually, the bugs can't get through. They can't uh, penetrate that, uh, that huge curtain of air. So that's how they keep the bugs out, but make the monorail go through. So it's kind of a neat thing when you think about it, that they actually thought this through to that level. So the hotel itself is really interesting. You know, the way the rooms work, if you want to get across to the other side, you have to do these wonky things to go across. And, you know, it's kind of funny the way they set it up, but it is actually kind of neat. And it's an interesting design and there's a lot to it. And it's kind of one of those fun places to go. I just, I like every once in a while when I have an opportunity, I like to just go in there and, you know, just hang out and have a bite to eat. Go to the, um, go to one of the cafes that's there in the, in the building and just have something to eat and just hang out for a while. It's just remarkable. I, I love going in this building. There's something about it. Maybe it reminds me of childhood. I'm not sure, but I, I find it kind of neat. And it's so, the design of it is so clever. And as far as I know, U.S. Steel didn't really use this design methodology a whole lot after this. They did a few things with it, but mostly other construction techniques came along and they did other things beyond that. But still, it was pretty neat that they were trying it and they had this idea for selling it and using Disney as kind of a test case for them. I had said in another video, I wasn't sure where the Epcot uh, model was put out when they had the International Chamber of Commerce and all the dignitaries from different places where Kissinger came in and Carter came in and they talked to them about what Epcot was. I said I didn't know where that was. It turns out it was actually in the Grand Republic Ballroom, which is on the other side. The Ballroom of the Americas is right here and the, uh, ball, the Grand Republic Ballroom is just on the other side where you can see the uh, signage behind me. So just to clarify that point, I know where it was now. 
I have to admit that I find the geometry of this hotel to be very strange. The fact that it kind of comes up at an angle and points up to the top, and the way it kind of comes together with uh, having 15 stories but not having 15 stories is very confusing. Sometimes I kind of find myself getting confused about what's on what floor. You enter on the first floor, the monorail is on the fourth floor, the second floor is the convention center. The third floor though, that's actually where you have catering services and a gym. So it's not really part of the, it's not really counted in there because they don't use it as one of the typical floors. So it's kind of weird that way. But the rest of it kind of comes together pretty nicely. And when you see that, when you see it go up and you count up to the uh, 15 floors, you realize, wait a minute, there's not actually 15, there are 14. But that's the you know, because you can't have a 13th floor because it's unlucky or something. It just, that always, that always kind of baffled me too, kind of on its own. Never really understood that completely. But that's, you know, a choice that's made. And that's a pretty conventional choice that you see in hotel designs, that there is no 13th floor typically. So it's just kind of interesting. But anyway, the hotel itself, you know, it's, it's well thought out. It's just kind of got this odd shapes to it because of the fact that it's an A-frame and that the uh, shape comes together kind of point comes into a point sort of like an A if you're looking at it from the end so you have to kind of count the floors and figure out how many floors there are so if I count them I can see that if the we come in on the fourth floor when we're looking across where you have the staircase on the outside the fourth floor is where the monorail is and if we count up we can see how many floors there are so as we look at the outside of the hotel we can see how the floors lay out we can see there's the first floor where you enter you got the second floor where the staircase is and then the third floor is actually where the gym is and the catering services and then of course the fourth floor is where the monorail is, so we can go through there. And then we move along and we see the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth floor. And then it skips to the fourteenth floor. And the fourteenth floor is the one where you have the penthouse suites. And then the fifteenth floor is where the California Grill is. There is no thirteenth floor in this hotel. So that's what makes the whole dynamic of it a little confusing. Also confusing is the way this lays out if you look at it from the end where the monorail comes in. You can see that the fifth floor is the one right above the monorail, and you can see where the sixth floor is, but it's hard to tell where the fifth floor is relative to the monorail. The confusion comes from the fact that the monorail platform is actually on the fifth floor. You have to take the escalator up in order to get to the monorail. So there are no guest rooms on that side of the building on the fifth floor, but there are some on the other side. It just adds to the overall confusion of the way the hotel is laid out. So you come the, from the fourth floor Grand Canyon concourse and go up to the fifth floor to catch the monorail. So how many was that again? So it's just confusing and that's why I get confused by it all the time. And I, you know, I have to look at the signage and figure out what floor things are on because it is kind of confusing the way that they set it up. But that's life. You know, it's just interesting that this, this hotel in particular is kind of set up like that. It's almost like there's a little mystery to it, just to make it a little more interesting in a way. It's intriguing because you have to kind of stop and think about it. It's like, wait a minute, I'm not on that floor. I'm on a different floor. What floor am I on? And then when you look at the uh, center column with the uh, mural on it, you see that it goes around on eight sides, which always confuses me because the, the, this walkway that goes between the floors, that's how you get to the opposite sides of the building when you're off the first, the fourth, sorry, fourth floor. That's how you get across to the other sides of the building. So that's where things get a little more interesting because you have that column that's in the middle starting on the fourth floor and going all the way up. So it gets confusing when you look at it because, you know, here on this side, there are two sides to it, right? So there's two parts to this. And then there's two on the other side of, this, of the column, and then there's one on either end. But down at the bottom, it changes a little bit too. So it's just kind of confusing the way it comes together. When I paused my video series, one of the things you may have noticed was that I put one little piece of footage out there with sort of a bonus material where I talked about the Supper Club. And you were probably wondering, what was Dave gonna talk about with the Supper Club? Well, I'm here to fill in the blanks on that. So this space behind me right here, that is what's known today as the California Grill. But when the Contemporary Resort first opened, they decided to put something in there that was more entertainment oriented, something that would bring in the big acts and make it kind of exciting and contemporary, if you will. So they had this thing that they called the Supper Club, where they'd bring in acts and they'd have them up there and they'd perform on stage in a corner of the Contemporary. It was really kind of an amazing thing up on the top floor of the Contemporary that they had this little club. Now you may remember that like in the 1950s and into the 60s, these big acts, these big, you know, singing acts, these performances, they would go around and they would have different lounge shows they would do. So Las Vegas was on the rise. And of course there was uh, Miami Beach had a number of people that came down and performed down there. And Disney figured they could have people come to Central Florida too, have them come, perform, have some fun, take in part of Disney World, and it could become more of the vacation destination in that sense where people would want to come here to enjoy things like that. So Supper Club was born. 
Now at some point, the supper club did close and they reopened it as something else. They had different meals that they would serve up here as sort of buffet type things, uh, buffeteria, if you will, where you'd come in and they'd have these higher end things. I remember the first time I ever ate Crips was right in there when I was probably about oh, 10 or so, I probably had them for the first time and I thought that was really cool. Now I make them all the time. But at the time it was so unique and so different and so unusual. I thought it was really neat to have something like that as a, as a meal. And they had a number of different dishes that were a little bit more fancy than you would find at other buffet type restaurants. And so it was really pretty neat that they had these things going on here. This is a kind of a fun place to come. They did a Sunday brunch that was really, really good. But I enjoyed coming there periodically. Um, when I lived in Orlando and when I worked at the property, I used to go in there from time to time and uh, have brunch because it was really nice. And then, of course, they decided that there was a way to elevate this even further, and that's when they closed it and opened the California Grill. And yes, I'm on the 14th floor of the Contemporary Resort Hotel. If you look out, you can see a lot that way, because you can see how high up I am, relatively speaking, of course, as part of the Contemporary. And if you look this way, you can see the Magic Kingdom kind of in there behind you, so it's really kind of a neat place. Now, if you do choose to dine at the California Grill, there is a benefit that goes along with the fireworks. They'll invite you back that evening. Say you have dinner at six o'clock and the fireworks aren't until 10. They'll invite you back at 10 to come up here and watch the fireworks, which is really pretty neat. It's a great place to see the show.